So hi, everyone, and welcome to the Next Generation Seminar Series. It's a networking event by Fields Institute to early career scholars, junior models, and epidemiologists working on or interested in mathematical modeling of infectious diseases and other threats to public health. Bonjour à tous et bienvenue dans la série des séminaires Next Generation. C'est un événement organisé par l'Institut Fields pour les chercheurs en début de carrière les modélisateurs et les épidémiologistes travaillant ou intéressés par la modélisation mathématique des maladies infectieuses et d'autres traitements pour la santé publique. First of all, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the Fields Institute operates for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca and Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Nous souhaitons reconnaître cette terre sur laquelle l'Institut Fields opère. C'est la terre traditionnelle des Zuron Wendat, des Sénèques, des Mississaugas depuis des milliers d'années. Aujourd'hui, ce lieu de rencontre abrite encore de nombreux peuples autochtones de tout Churchill Island, et nous sommes reconnaissants d'avoir l'opportunité de travailler sur cette terre. For today, we have a special guest, Professor Jude Kong, who works in mathematics and statistics department at York University and the founded director, director of the Africa Canada Artificial Intelligence and Data Innovative Consortium. He is the regional node liaison to the steering committee of the Canadian Black Scientist Network, a member of the scientific advisory committee for, of the Mathematics for Public Health Network, a member of national uh, COVID-19 modeling uh, rap rapid uh, response task force and a member of the Canadian Centre for Disease Modeling. His talk today will be on estimation of COVID-19 assessment uh, rates across Africa and uh, drivers of transmission dynamics worldwide in the early stages, where he will be sharing his experience in helping governments and communities to manage and contain the spread of COVID-19 and presenting some of the models that he designed and analyzed for early response and community-based risk mitigation and control of developing epidemics using COVID-19 as a case study. And uh, he presents, he will pre be presenting the results. The Professor Jude Kong travaille au département de mathématiques de statistiques de l'Université de York. Il est directeur fondateur de Consortium Africa Canada sur euh, l'intelligence artificielle et l'innovation des données. Il est le de liaison régionale du comité directeur de Canadian Black Scientist Network, membre du comité des consultants scientifiques du réseau mathématique pour la santé publique, membre du groupe de travail national de euh, réponse euh, rapide pour la modélisation de la COVID-19 et membre du centre euh, canadien euh, de uh, the Canada de modélisation des maladies. Il parlera aujourd'hui sur estimation of COVID-19 assessment rates across Africa and drivers of transmission dynamics worldwide uh, in the early stages. So, il parlera son expérience, son expérience en aidant les gouvernements et les communautés à gérer, à contenir la propagation du COVID-19 en présentant certains modèles qu'il a conçus analysé pour la réponse précoce et l'atténuation des risques et le contrôle des épidémies en développement dans les communautés en utilisant euh, COVID-19 comme cas d'étude en présentant les résultats. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jude, for accepting our uh, invitation and the floor is yours, Professor. Thank you so much, Dr. Seka. Let me share my screen and uh, right from there, my friend. All right. Let me know if you're able to see my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, that's a great introduction. Uh, bonjour à tous and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jude Kong and I'm the director of the Africa Canada Artificial Intelligence and Data Innovation Consortium. Um, today, I will be sharing some of the work that uh, we have done in my group, helping government and communities in Africa to contain and, con and manage the spread of COVID-19, as well as in Canada. So I would talk about the estimation of COVID-19 assessment rates 
across Africa and the drivers of transmission dynamics worldwide in the earlier stage of the dynamics. So I'll focus mostly on that. Subsequently, if we do, a, is, if Dr. Sekek invite us next time, we'll come and expand the conversation from there. Uh, before I move on with my presentation, I really want to acknowledge my funders, the IDRC and the Swedish International Development Agency. The IDRC is the Canadian International Development Research Center who initiated this work and trusted us and supported us to work with communities and government in Africa to control and manage the spread of COVID-19. I will calling one to acknowledge my other funders across Canada, um, New Frontiers in Research, ANSEC, um, as well as the Black Canadian Scientists Network for the work they are doing to ensure that um, tables are made for other people to sit on and be able to take part in informing policies within our country. We all know what diversity can bring on the table. Um, as I acknowledge the IDRC and CIDA, I would like to acknowledge the team that is leading the work in the nine African countries, across nine African countries, as well as Canada, that have been directing. So I really want to acknowledge them for the great work and for ensuring that they continue to help governments and communities to control the spread of COVID-19, um, address mis- and disinformation, throughout and they have not stopped and they have continued going forward so i really want to acknowledge them and thank them for their amazing job so they did a great job um i would not be doing a service to myself i take all this credit without talking about the great team that had gotten the work that i'm just sharing with you today head on which are my team members ranging from undergrad students to grad students to postdocs that are my friends um, when I say friends, I mean it. Uh, there are people I rely on that I can call at any hour and they'll get things done for me. And so I want to acknowledge them. Whatever I'm presenting here may look good, but they are behind me. They are the ones that did the work. So I really want to thank them. Uh, some of them are not here in this picture, since this was taken at a one day picture on Zoom and I've not updated, but there are some of them that are not here, but I really want to acknowledge all of them. This picture just represents some of the team that I work with that have been helping to do the work, diverse team I work with. And our work actually focused, have a foundation in SDG3, health and wellness, SDG5, gender and equality, and SDG17, which is partnership for the goal. And that's why we create partnership around the world. The pillars of our work is timely and reliable data for public health decision-making. We pride in that resilient and strong and fair health systems, inclusion and equity for vulnerable groups. Even within Canada, most of our work is centered around the gender and Finnish community and other economically disadvantaged communities. So we're pride in that and bringing all voices, as you will see in our group, we ensure that the group that we put together represent the country where we find ourselves very diverse. And what we do is that we look at earlier detection of disease, earlier warning systems, earlier response, mitigation and control, while using Manmatic as a catalyst to address all these themes. Um, today, I will focus on these three components of our work that we have been doing, which is on earlier warning, earlier response and mitigation. But we always acknowledge the fact that for us to solve these disease issues within our community, it needs to we need to pay attention to the environment, the animal and humans and multidisciplinary. And that's why SDG 17 is the major component of one of our foundation. So we look at the one health approach. Why ensuring that we inform policy in whatever we do, there's training across. That's why we have a lot of students in our team that's working with us, producing the results as well as learning from the other ones or from us. So that's very important to us. Um, today, I want to talk to you about the earlier stage of a disease outbreak. And you may be wondering why it's the time I want to tell a story throughout with the next generation mathematicians that will be informed policy in the country. And I want to start my story today by what happened within the pandemic or what mathematicians always do during the earlier phase Like we have monkeypox right now, so that the great next generation mathematicians that will be informing policymakers present in our midst here, understand 
the thought process that always go into this decision. So let's assume we have COVID coming to our community. As a model, like you are behind the scenes, very active, sleepless night. As policymaker, you rely on what the model is going to give you. You're out there at the forefront. That's what people know. You saying this, you make them look smart. You modelers, they are smart. Our policymakers are smart, but you make them look better smart. And your goal when the disease comes is always um, what is is it? What is the basic reproduction number? You always start asking yourself if I infect, if this disease comes into my community and one person is able to infect more than one person then the likelihood that that was triggered and spread is high. But if one person can infect less than a human being, then obviously the disease will not spread because one person who is infected into my community will not infect other people. So you always pay a lot of attention with the early data on the spread to look at what we normally call the basic reproduction number, which is, the number of person that an infectious person can infect in a naive population. By naive here means that there's no control measure, nobody's immune to the disease. And if that value is, we look at, well, if below one means that the person will infect less than one person, it will die down. Above one, it means that the disease will spread. Once we realize that the disease will spread as a cause of COVID, then we start asking ourselves, is it going to overwhelm our hospital system, our capacity, are we going to have enough nurses, enough beds in the hospital to handle the patient that will be coming up? We all have heard about um, ensuring that we do not, uh, we flatten the curve. We heard Trudeau say this over and over. Let's flatten our curve when COVID started. The idea there is, well, if the group is such a way that is going to bypass our capacity, this was to be our capacity, how do we ensure that we slow down the growth rate, but maybe prolong the time, ensuring that we do not overwhelm our hospital system? Once we realize that this is something that's going to spread in our community. And this is exactly the thought process that went into our mind once um, COVID started. And I, I will, today I'll be sharing with you some of the decisions that we made behind the scenes uh, when COVID started. Once we re uh, COVID started here in Canada, where my mind was and a lot of the team that we were working together within my lab. So I will talk to you about the earlier response and community-based risk mitigation and control of developing epidemics. I will talk to you about estimation of the epidemiological parameters and ascertain min rates from earlier transmission of COVID across Africa. And then I will talk about the factors that influence the spread of the COVID-19. And then I will share something to you. It's a secret, though. When you hear this, <laughs> it's a secret to us. But the reason why I'm sharing this is that we are recruiting a team to work on this earlier warning framework for emerging and re-emerging infectious disease. And one of my undergrad students, Kevin, has done an amazing job doing this. And a lot of other team, um, Zara and the other team within my group that are working on ensuring that we tap into this data set. And I'll be able to share with you as well as the whole network we have in the country that I'm leading with some of my colleagues to help ensure that we come up with frameworks that address this issue. Um, I will now move on to start some of the work that we have done and I will focus on these first two goals here, um, the earlier response and mitigation and control of developing epidemics. And this is where we thought about estimation of epidemiological parameters and asymptomatic rates from earlier transmission. So I'll talk about this component for a while and then I'll move to the other one. Um, when COVID started, if you look at the news, uh, you in, in the initial outbreak, there were a lot, I was getting data from African countries actually. And I was equally following every paper. I had an algorithm that each paper that's published on, um, on Google, if get into Google Scholar that talk about Africa, COVID, I, I was alerted. I was following this very clearly. And there were a lot of papers that came up wondering why there was a low burden of COVID in Africa. And if you look at the data here, it's one of my postdoc plotted the first 14 days that we plotted together here, where if you look at Togo here, it's flat. You look at um, the uh, South American principle here, so they had four cases and then flat for a while. 
you you'll be like ah, the continent is safe and as we gather in the country here there was a meeting at the field institute where the tax force for COVID 19 was led and i attended that meeting and i started thinking about the africa and i reached out to hillary and the other people in the africa cdc and we thought of a tax force together actually based on what we are doing here but um at that point in my life when i saw these articles what was running in my mind was uh, I thought of my community. I grew up in a very small community here in a place called Jackie. And um, when I was growing up at that time, um, there was one, all of these regions used to have uh, six doctors, uh, six uh, doctors sent by the government. And Jackie alone had one doctor, a very huge area. I even look at NBME very and if you were found in a community here long distance, it would take five days or so to ever walk to, or more than that, a week to ever walk to the main center where the hospital was located. But there was one hospital and one doctor. So most of the time, my village, when you grow up and you are sick, uh, you never end up in the hospital because if you can treat yourself unless you're dying, that's when they knock doors to carry somebody to the hospital. I remember in my village, again, this is not about Cameroon, same as in Canada, when you go to Nona vote and it, it, you have different communities. I grew up in a very small communities. And in my village, um, we had few people with a car. And when somebody was sick, you need to move around and knock at doors to get someone to carry the person to that general hospital where you had one doctor. And you could go when, if two people were sick at that time, you could go when the person was going to carry the person and it would take long distance for them to come back. So somebody may die throughout the whole night. So. The reason why I thought about this and putting this is that in this community, unless, unless it was really serious, you wouldn't want to go to care about the hospital because it takes a while to ever get to the hospital or when you go to the pharmacy and buy things. And so um, when I saw the low rates and knowing that the, the life expectancy in Africa is less than 65, I was thinking that, well, with the life expectancy being 50 something, the, the, the great youth population, and uh, the, the, given the system, the healthcare system, nobody knows what is happening. Uh, it's not clear that um, COVID is not spreading. What is clear is that in the former system, data is not recorded. And so we wanted to find out the true case count. And we started with the basic uh, model, which is just the basic susceptible, exposed, infectious, asymptomatic, uh, and recovered model. But when we had this basic model of people getting exposed, we break down the infectious into severe infectious and mild infectious. So in, in the infectious compartment, this is normally typical asymptomatic. Then we break down the infectious component into the severe infectious and mild infectious. And then everybody recover at different time rates based on the viral load in your system. So again, for normal mathematicians, we are assuming here that if you get in contact with somebody, there's a chance that you can become infected or you will not. Let's say you were this blue green guy here, you get in touch with this, you can become red or green. And so that's the chance that leads you from S to E. And then after E, after a time, you become you become infectious, or you just be infectious but asymptomatic where you're not showing symptoms. Um when you put that in terms of equation, then you assume that well, the susceptible will be changing based on when they get in contact with people from this group and then they will move this class into this other class and then they recall they, they they leave the exposed class after a while and when they leave the exposed class they can join one two three the severe infectious the mild infectious asymptomatic so we divided this into these classes and then after a while they recover that's why you have all of these components and we assume that the infectiousness of this these classes are different people that are more severe has more viral load and so they will infect more. So that's why the infection is between one and 1 1.5 of the asymptomatic, um, the, the mild cases. And then for the asymptomatic, they will be less than the mild cases. So we assume those um, infectiousness. Then what we did was we wanted to estimate the basic reproduction number and other parameters including most importantly, the reporting rate of different cases and the overall reporting rate. 
given how the importance of the basic reproduction norm, I remember if it is high, you have an outbreak below one, no outbreak. So we wanted to estimate this for the countries to know the level, the true value. And what we did was that if we assume that RM fraction of the severe cases, we have, so if you compute the basic reproduction number, you have this. This is a component from the severe, the mild, and asymptomatic. Then if you just isolate for beta here, which is the transmission rate, then you can make the transmission rate a function of the basic reproduction number. Then when you assume the fraction that can be reported, the mild and severe cases, assuming that the asymptomatic cases are not even reported, then if you keep count of the total number of incidents that you know and the total number of incidents that you don't know, so CI here will be the ones that we know, and CK here will be the total incidents that the non-incident CI is the unknown incident, then you can be able to write this cumulative, the total number as they're adding on daily basis as a function of this exposed class using this. And so if you now apply this to this equation and integrate it, you could have the total symptomatic as a function of this. If then you apply this to the original equation that we have seen here, if you then apply this and take into account, rewriting this in this way uh, and taking into account this reported cases and the basic reproduction number, where the transmission rate now is a function of the basic reproduction number, we end up in this system of equation that have the reporting, rate of the mild and severe cases as well as the basic reproduction number and the relative infectiousness of each of the class so from this this is the same system just changing this equation based on the fact that we have introduced this guy on this left hand side and taking into account the total number of unknown, total number of infectious cases as the onset once we had this the next thing was can we estimate this from the data that's made available um, the data that's made available here will be very important. And I want to relate back to Cameroon again, where I grew up. In Cameroon, when this started, there was a center in um, Yaoundé. And I lived in a very small community far away from Yaoundé, from the capital city. So for, 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 for cases to live there, to the original center where this was a Santa Pasteur, it, it will take a while for cases to ever reach Santa Pasteur. So the tendency that somebody will be infected and the case will ever reach there, it takes forever. So with this one center, and it may not in, in other cases. And so we thought of, okay, let's get whatever the centers have. We did get locally relevant data from these centers from all the 54 countries. Um, let's try to, well, because we are going to be estimating what we know, so we use the cumulative cases of what is given to the centers. We use the reported cases of what is given to the centers, and we calculate this. Uh, again, this is just a fraction of the mild cases and the proportion of the severe cases. But they, they, this is the under-reporting rate, the rate at which that is being reported. Can we estimate that rate? Now, the time period that we used was from the initial phase of COVID-19, when there was no major um, cases, to when maybe cases are less than 40. So we start with the start and the end when the cases are the, the, within 14 days or when the stringency index is still less than 50. And when we acquire this, then we, we use a um, Markov chain Monte Carlo method with um, delayed rejection adaptive metropolitan algorithm to estimate the parameters. And then because we didn't know the initial distribution of these parameters, we use an uninformed prior or uniform distribution. Once we fitted the data to parameters, if you look at here, this is Algeria here. We, and this is same throughout. I pick Algeria because the first country in the continent, actually. But this was same throughout the entire continent. But what we found out was that the, 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 the model just captured the data pretty well. Uh, and, and the goodness of fit statistics that we used was really decent throughout. Um, if you look at Algeria here, which will be the same throughout here, the, this rate here is the non cases, and then the line is the model cases, and then this shaded region is the 95% high probability density interval. And then this blue here actually is the data, um, the, the data of the incident cases, the cumulative, this is the incident cases. So we captured that throughout and it fit really well. Um, we equally estimated the reporting rate. If you look at here, Algeria only reported 1.14% of their cases, 
Uh, this is just the cumulative known cases. If you look at this bar graph here, that's a ratio here, is a compulsion. It's kind of the proportion of this severe, mild, asymptomatic, and recovered cases within the population. And the black here is the modeled total cases that uh, incident cases. Now, when we look at these, we realize that, well, um, the total number of actually non cases, the, the, the reported cases far below the cases. So, Algeria is not unique in here. I'm not picking Algeria to say Algeria only report 1.14. No, um, Algeria is the first continent in the continent, but this was clear across the continent. Uh, Sudan and Gambia reported collectively most with uh, this could be based on the population of Gambia and uh, it's, it's and there's something questionable uh, well not questionable but it was greater Sudan reported that <laughs> not questionable uh they reported 27 and 22 percent respectively with most reported less than five percent in the entire continent uh most of the countries then the basic reproduction number actually uh with the true reporting value which are this blue one here we realized that the true values were based on the estimated actually, we're 2.02, .02, that's the average across all the countries with Zambia, the range between Zambia and Nigeria with Zambia having 1.12 and Nigeria having 3.64, meaning that one person in Nigeria could infect on average 3.64 other persons. And in Zambia, one person will infect 1.12. But what was more important, my friends and my colleagues is that if you look at this red here, which is based on the true data that we got. In essence, based on that video outbreak, this will indicate that there was no outbreak because this was not more than one, based on the definition of outbreak. But in reality, the true one was 2.02. .02. So one person on average could infect two other persons. But because of the younger population in the continent and the great strength in the continent, they are able to subdue any hazard that come their way. So they were able to survive this and just keep on striving. I don't know if the, the consequences may be different. This is not speaking to the <laughs> um, whatever COVID may cause in the system, but just saying that their immune system could fight it within the specific time. The daily reporting rate, actually, we estimated that the mean overall daily reporting rate was 5.37. Uh, and among all countries with the highest of 30 in Libya, this is Libya here. This is the overall, the ones that they truly reported. And the, and, and the lowest in South Tome and Principe down here. South Tome and Principe almost reported not, uh, nothing. Um, and then the estimated mean report rate of severe infections was 38%, with the highest. So if you look at this, this is severe, with the highest being in Cameroon and the lowest in Togo. And the estimated mean reported of mild infections was 13.74%, with the highest of 47 in Benin and lowest in Mauritania. Then we went on to look at um, the overall reporting rate. And I want to speak strongly into Sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at this other Sub-Saharan Africa from leaving our Northern part of Africa. Okay, let's cut down South Africa from Sub-Saharan Africa a little bit, not that South Africa wants to cut out, but let's just leave it out a little bit. Looking at this middle part here, it speaks more into the healthcare systems. And this speaks more into one of the reasons why I got into research, which was looking at my own community and malaria. But this is very important in, if you look deeply into this and you grew up in this sub-Saharan Africa, I grew up in Cameroon, Nigeria is the same way I spend a lot of my time. I live a lot in Nigeria. A lot of these countries around here, the, the fact that the healthcare system is not well developed, not prepared for what will come in, it's as a result of the fact that research in this area has not been decolonized. It speaks to the importance of decolonizing research in this component because innovation was to be left to the colonial masters and you were just supposed to acquire the basic knowledge and the colonial masters were going to uh, be able to provide for everything. I remember at this point when there was COVID having a meeting with uh, Director of Santa Pasteur in Yaoundé and most of the Cameroonian data was sent to Santa Pasteur, France. And this is the same throughout the continent where we had these meetings with different uh, health units within the uh, countries, with Nigeria CDC to, to Cameroonian Santa Pasteur. This alone have really pushed me to say, how do we work as a team to ensure that 
first of all, we are able to work and support the healthcare system in this sub-Saharan Africa to be sustained, working with the team there, homegrown team. And secondly, to ensure that we help researchers, we work with researchers to get a name from each other and ensure that we build a strong, solid foundation that can address this issue. And that speaks to what my team is looking at at the moment. Um, for the proportion of severe and mild asymptomatic cases, um, if you look at this, you realize that, well, uh, we, if you look at the rate, this is organized in descending order of these uh, severe cases. But what we find is that the, the mean estimated were 54.546 for severe infectious, 27 for mild infectious, and 66. What you realize here is that the proportion of these severe in, uh, subclinical infections among the other cases, which is just a property of the disease, basically, if one look at this. Uh, if, if you were to look at this and compare, and this is not just unique to Africa, this was common if you look at the literature across the, the global north as well. If you look at the main relative infectiousness, we realize that uh, with respect to the, 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 severe, the, the mild cases, the severe cases have a rel relative infection of 1.25 and then the asymptomatic 0.44. If you look at this, the, the ratio of the asymptomatic cases throughout was relatively constant. We speak to the characteristics of the disease. So by fitting this simple model, we were able to estimate the true case count across Africa and get the real values, which further help us to inform policies that we're to inform policies with the governments that we work with in nine African countries. There are other models that we adjusted going forward. Um, our model just suggests that the basic reproduction number is higher than actually reported. So it means that disease was actually spreading, but in fact, it was not reported, much more than was reported. Uh, th then the values that we collected here, as time goes on, team have changed. This is just within the initial phase of the pandemic. As time goes on, we had adjusted the model when vaccines came in and we have different models, which I will continue the story subsequently if Dr. Seke invite me to come back. I want to talk about the second part after we estimated the basic reproduction number. So which is just the impact of social, economic, environmental factors on the dynamics of COVID-19. So after we had estimated the basic reproduction number for each local community, we did not just keep it this at the national level, we did this for each local community that we were working in. What we found now, looking at the data, what I was just presenting the situation here of South Africa at the aggregate level, look at the country as a whole. If you look at this South Africa data here, the way it moves up. Then let's look at Australia. And Australia is almost similar to South Sudan that went up straight and came down. And then let's look here at Nigeria, which you end up this way. What you will find from here is that at the onset, it evolved differently across countries and across communities. This was not just unique to countries. This was equally with, country, with uh, communities across. So we found out that COVID-19 was evolving differently across countries. And we started wondering within ourselves once we went into this to be like, well, if this were to be the case, what is really causing this different trajectory, COVID to take different trajectory across countries? We hypothesize that demographic, clinical and health systems, social and environmental factors had something to do with it. But we had to be sure about that in order to conclude that. And we thought strongly about the policies that different government may have put in place. And uh, the third process was that if we say that the policies put in place cause that, then indirectly that lead to indigeneity because the, the, the policies were in response to the initial trajectory. I don't know, one can argue. So if the policies were in response to nature trajectory, therefore we cannot assume that the policies actually were the one that caused the trajectory because the trajectory caused the policies. And so we went on to study if these factors were responsible. So we collected a huge lot of um, 
different demographic disease, economic, environmental, and social variables, which are present some of them here. Population of ages 20 and 35 youths, uh, mortality rate from lower respiratory infectious disease, mortality rate from infectious and parasitic disease. We look at the Gini index, the ease of doing business, we look at temperature, we look at precipitation, we look at air pollution, we look at average people use of social media to organize offline action, we look at, inter, uh, we look at uh, internet filtering, we look at air transport. And um, in order to analyze this, given that we had an output, what we did was that we use a generalized additive model. And if you think of a generalized additive model, think of that linear model where if you think of the equation of straight line y equals to mx plus c, you think of this in this form, but now, or a regression model, but this is now a function, a nonlinear function, could be a nonlinear function. And then the output here is the output that we're looking at, function of the output. And then these are the error term uh, that you're modeling. And this is, a, this is a strictly parametric component of the model, which you could think of it as the intercept in a straight line. Um, we equally assume that there are random effects that may have caused the spread to take the dimension I took, meaning that the fact that you're from Asia or close to China or the fact that you're from North America, the way the spreading rate may have taken may be based on your region proximity. So we took that as a random effect. The total number of days from when China had their first case to when you had their, the, from the total number of days to the first 30 case from when China had their first 30 case, we equally took that as a random effect. And the gross domestic product was equally taken a random effect as well as we calculated the average under reporting across countries and took that as a random effect that that could have affected that initial trajectory. When we fitted the model to data, we identify, we realized that uh, our model, first of all, had a high explanatory power and predictability of 75%. And we identified these four major variables as having a high impact on it. And so I will now talk about these four variables, which was the youth, the Gini inequality, the number of people living in city agglomerates, and the use of social media to organize offline action. I will start with um, the social media to organize online action. Again, this analysis is at the own face of COVID-19. But what we realized based on the social media that a lot of us from the Africa, Canada, Artificial Intelligence and Data Innovation Consortium belong to was that in the absence of scientifically informed information, there were a lot of false information that was spreading in social media. It belonged to a lot of different Nigeria, Cameroon and other countries, social media group with all of these spreading, even Canadian groups. But in order not to empower um, politicians to say that we were blaming social media, we wanted to be very clear that social media may have been used to spread this information, but in the presence of scientifically information, we do believe that social media will play a very positive role. Uh, because if you look at this, as uh, the use of social media to organize offline action increased, there was an increase in the spreading rate. But we did say that, well, we hope that when scientifically informed information become available, that will not be the case. Another variable that was really, uh, that came out to be very impactful or significant was the youth between the ages of 20 and 35. And uh, our interpretation of that was that if you have a huge youth population, even though they increase the spreading rate, they equally confer resilience against the disease. And uh, if you have a high old population, they will be more susceptible to disease, but they will exhibit a reduced transmission rate. And so when you take the synergistic result, you will realize that the intermediate level of youth is related will lead to a higher spreading rate of COVID-19. The another one that stood out was the Gini inequality. And this was meaningful to us in the sense that if you have countries with a high Gini inequality, um, this refers to the income inequality, then there is physical segregation. And thus, 
this may have initially prevented the spread of COVID-19 because of this physical segregation. I don't know if that should be a thing to exist, but that may have been it. Uh, if you look at country with a low gene inequality, it means that there are better social integrations, fewer people are left behind, this is what we want. And so that may have led to a lower spreading rate. And that's why we have this. Uh, one thing that we equally find was the number of people in city agglomerates, where we realized that, well, the higher the number of people living in the city because of the huge population coming in touch, in contact with each other, the higher the spreading rate. What we could not explain from our results was this behavior here, this U10 behavior. And so it was difficult to explain why a lower number of people living in the city could lead to that. So we could not explain that as well. So the conclusion here was that we, we strongly emphasized within my team that this is at the country level, even though we did for local, local level within the communities. And so um, without looking at correcting for temporal strength and reporting a mortality rate, this cannot be generalized to local communities within the country. Uh, with, what that, with the work that we did, uh, even though we sacrificed these local realities, a work like ours can be used to inform policies going forward. We, we strongly emphasize that the basic reproduction number is not an indicative of the eventual outbreak sizes of, or the nature of the subsequent waves. And this will speak strongly to, North Korea, to South Korea, where you realize at the onset that there was a spike going up straight in South Korea and it came down and that did not speak. So they have a high R0 value, basic reproduction number, but that doesn't transfer to the total number of people that will be infected or the eventual um, outbreak size. Now, the factors that influence are not the basic reproduction number that we identify here reflect the naive or the interesting factors that may determine the country's vulnerability to COVID-19. And this is very important going forward with mutant strains coming up here and there. Um, Again, these values here at that point, assuming that they were condition put in place because these are basically a position number and a control reproduction number. Um, if certain things end up being lifted, now that we have people are trying to social distance, wearing their masks, if all of this get lifted and things go back to normal, then those country characteristics will still control the dynamics in a similar way. We did further went on to study this and realized that that was the case with the second wave. Uh, this study aims to inform the ongoing control of the pandemic, actually, and we hope that our result can be useful. From here, I want to talk now about, you realize that we started from these two, started a new faculty, we're now moving backwards. I want to talk about earlier warning systems for imaging and re-imaging infectious disease. We are building a team on this um, and we welcome a lot of people joining us. Uh, we, I currently, with my colleague, Jong Lima, lead a network within the country and we want to add as many people as this and people that are willing to help us organize workshop in this area warning system since I'm talking to the next generation uh, scientists to join us in this. Um, I will share what within my lab we have been able to do. Subsequently, um, if we will come here to share the work that as a network within Canada we have been able to do. But I just want to speak to the great scientists that we have here that we're looking for a team. We're building a team on this earlier warning frameworks because it's very important that we know that exists gonna occur before it occur. So um, what exists in the country right now or what is being used around the world? Um, in order to be able to, the idea here is, could we, is there a way to determine that something like COVID-19 is going to happen before it happens? or any other disease, could be a local outbreak. So far right now, there are two popular platforms that are used. One is the PROMIT, which is a program for monitoring imaging diseases. And this is the official platform for the International Society for Infectious Diseases. And the way this platform work is, they have volunteers within their platform. And these volunteers, there are 30,000 of them or so. They observe, they monitor things in different levels and then send emails if they start suspecting anything. And then there is somebody that look at the emails and work with the system to verify the 
authenticity of that particular email. One that I'm so equally proud of is the one that was developed here in Canada, the Global Public Health Intelligence Network for Earlier Warning Outbreak, GIFN, which is by the Public Health Agency of Canada. So proud. And they provide 40% of the World Health Earlier Warning Outbreak information. And the way GIFN work is that Again, it was created in the 1990s. Different collect all news reported in local communities. So for instance, if you grow up in the typical communities in, Ab in Abuja or Calabar, and they are reporting a typical outbreak in Calabar in Nigeria, Jifan will collect that news. And then if it continue, a lot, a lot of local news articles are reporting that, then they will they have the agencies maybe working with WHO to verify that. And they do it for all languages in the WHO. But the thing about this is that uh, one could speak into why they didn't predict COVID and uh, Blue Dot could take credit for, oh, we predicted COVID before COVID happened. Blue Dot using Promit. And why don't you have us here as one of the top this thing? That could speak strongly and Blue Dot could attack us for that. Uh, but we could talk about Blue Dot later and other groups that exist. There are other ones, not, not ignoring them, but these are the two major ones. Uh, the, these two major ones are not public system. Um, our hope so far was, can we come up with something that's public where everybody contributes? Starting at the level of Canada, and I'm building, we are building together with my colleague, Jong Lima, we're building a team on this. Can we, Blue Dot, um, GFAN rely on news article, um, Promet rely on citizen scientists. Our hope is to combine that and with the team that have worked in these groups, which we have in our network, and equally my Google searches, social media and newspaper articles, to combine all these signals to see if we can be able to predict the outbreak of a new disease before it ever occur. So far, we've been working on this as a network, but I will share some of the work that we have done on imaging diseases with you. I will come to you subsequently to share the, our work on earlier warning system with the workshop that we have coming up at the Film Institute, if granted. But today I wanna to share with you with what we're trying to do. What we're doing is that we wanna look at the newspaper articles online, Facebook, Twitter, other social media platform, Google searches. For emerging diseases that already, re-emerging diseases that already exist, we want to keep on monitoring them in real time and collect different metrics from different platforms. Then train an AI algorithm to see if they can predict it before a disease occur. As an example of the metrics that we are collecting from the different social media platforms, let me talk about Twitter here for the sake of time. I may not talk about uh, Twitter, I may not talk about Facebook and the other ones that we're using or newspaper or the blogs. Let me talk about Google searches here. But we are collecting this from all the social media platform across, but I will just talk about Google searches here. In the Google, in Google searches here, through a systematic review and checking online, we have, came to a, we have come to a conclusion that um, the ratio of seven days average to the entire period and the rate of searches, the rate of spike of searches, and the concavity of these searches could be important metrics that can predict if a disease that had occurred in the past is going to occur again. From Tito, again, we're getting disease Google searches, but this will be in a combination with other signals. So even though Google scaled this as 100 per country and based on level of country, this is not affected by those because this is just the ratio of these searches to the period of that particular disease. And then the spike of that searches and the concavity whether is it decreasing or increasing? So we have done this for different emerging disease across different region. And this is, we update this dynamically every day in our, if you go to the Africa Canada Artificial Intelligence and Data Innovation Consortium website, you find this being updated on daily basis. And this institution here in Ghana, and this is monkeypox, for instance, we have malaria, we have other things. If you will look at our, if you go to our website, you'll see here the seven to 180 ratio the linear and quadratic. 
the one, 7 to 1 18 ratio is based on the assumption earlier on when we started with flu, which has a periodicity of six months. And have a year. And then we were just like, okay, in the last seven days compared to the period before, how have the searches spike? The linear here is the spike, the rate at which is spiking. Irrespective of how Google Cap is, how many people are searching this? If you look at this within monkeypox, we need time here. I used this long ago, but if you look at our website, you, you will see the one for today. We, up, we update this on re, in real time. We have made the algorithm to be in real time. So Google will spike here. Um, how's the spike? And then the quadratic one is, is it increasing or tending to be decreasing? Convex or concave? So when you look at this, the call intensity will be based on that. So through this, we'll be able to know if a disease is coming up in a particular location in the world since we update this in real time. The advantage with Google topics instead of keywords is that it's not language sensitive. The question could be around other platforms that are not Google in other countries. We'll get there. We have not integrated other platform, non-Google platform for now. We have used Twitter and other social media that are popular within a global north here and global south. And uh, we are using Google for now. What I'm sharing with you is Google as well as the other blogs that we're checking. Here is um, look at the linear part, which is a spike. And this is on monkeypox, actually. If you look at the color intensity here, we vary. And this will be based on how many people are searching this? Is it increasing or is this, what is the slope? So that's spike the rates. So we use an exponential growth model in order to estimate this within a short time, looking at the seven day average. And this is same with, um, the quadratic, which is okay, are the searches going to be turning that downward or are they, is it going upward? Are they, am I checking this at the point when they're about to be going downward so that I feel that it's coming down or not? So this gives us some metrics and an indication of what is happening with a particular disease. How are we going to move from here to a disease that have never occurred? Currently, right now, we have identified different keywords and thanks to um, a lot of my students, I want to thank Kevin, who, who is here with us present, who did an amazing job on this and have identified these keywords. We have checked different keywords for different diseases across the world. And the idea would be what do people search? Once we get, we, we have all these platforms for different diseases, we want to be able now to go backwards, which we have started doing to say, do this, can we train a model that will be able to predict an emerging disease based on those keywords? which is something we're almost getting there. We did that for, for COVID-19 and we have been able to see that we could use what we have for, for Twitter, for Google searches and predict COVID-19. But we want to be able to generalize this to, for us to come online and say, we already have a framework that can predict any disease before or call, any emerging disease. We want to be sure that we have tested it to all other um, diseases, especially the three pandemics that we had, serious pandemics that we've had in history or generation. And so we are in the process of doing that and we are working towards that. But right now, what I wanted to show to you here is just a hint into the metrics and the approach that we are using to build this AI power toolkit that will be able to predict disease in real time. If you check our platform right now, we made this one go public, you'll see this occurring in real time on a daily basis. And this is done by one of my undergrad student, Kevin, who's working so hard on it. Uh, this is a team that I'm working with in the entire country and is led by myself and Jong Ling Ma, who's present here. And we will be moving not just in Africa to build the Global South. So subsequently, we'll be announcing a new network, which is the Global South Artificial Intelligence for Pandemic and Epidemic Preparedness Network. And we'll, we'll welcome everyone here to join the team that will be working on this. This will involve a lot of teams in South America and the Caribbean, Africa, North, North Africa and the Arab world, as well as Asia. So we're moving to that. I really want to thank you and Messi Bukwa too. Thank you very much for this great talk, great ideas that you shared with us.